Please welcome Assistant Secretary of State for Educational and Cultural Affairs, Evan Ryan, to the podium. Good morning, Mandela Washington Fellows. And welcome to Washington, D.C. Thank you all for being here this morning and bringing this excitement with you. I am honored to officially open the 2016 Mandela Washington Fellowship Presidential Summit. Before I begin my remarks, I ask that you all join me in a moment of silence to honor the life of John Paul Usman. John Paul was a talented fellow from Nigeria who we lost far too soon. He will be dearly missed by all of us, including Mandela Washington Fellows and our staff, but his legacy and passion will serve as an inspiration to us all. Please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you. I would now like to congratulate each and every one of you for being chosen to participate in the Mandela Washington Fellowship. You all have impressive accomplishments in civic leadership, in business, in the public sector, and were selected from a pool of 40,000 talented applicants. So this is a highly competitive program and you should be very proud to be a part of this year's class. It is a great privilege to be speaking to Africa's talented and accomplished young leaders. I'm thrilled to see many familiar faces in the crowd. I was able to meet 100 of our fellows in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And I would also like to congratulate the 36 U.S. universities and colleges who hosted our fellows. I cannot thank you enough for your commitment, your expertise, and the hospitalities you and your communities showed our fellows during their time at your institutions. So let's thank... I'd like to thank Appalachian State University Appalachian State, Arizona State University, Bridgewater State University, Cambridge College, Clark Atlanta University, Dartmouth College, Drake University, Duquesne University, Florida International University, Georgia State University, Howard University, Indiana University, Kansas State University, Lincoln University, Northwestern University, Portland State University, Purdue University, Rutgers, the, the State University of New Jersey, State University of New Jersey, Syracuse University, Ohio State University, the Presidential Precinct, the University of California, Berkeley, the University of Texas, Austin. The University of Wisconsin, Stout. The, the University of California, Davis. The University of Delaware. 
the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the University of Iowa, the University of Maine, the University of Minnesota, the University of Nevada, Reno, the University of Notre Dame, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Virgin Virginia Commonwealth University, Vir Virginia Tech, and last but not least, Wagner College. The United States recognizes that Africa plays a crucial role in the world's collective prosperity and security. Africa's economies are among the fastest growing in the world, spurring opportunities and innovations in business, entrepreneurship, technology, energy, and medicine. Africa's rising youth population has also been immensely instrumental in strengthening democratic institutions, fostering economic growth, and enhancing peace and security in Africa. President Obama launched the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders to recognize the critical role being played by the next generation of African leaders, all of you here in this room, who are already making significant contributions during this tremendous period of reform, growth, and opportunity all across the continent. Through the Mandela Washington Fellowship, President Obama's vision is to partner with you, young people across Sub-Saharan Africa, and empower you with new skills, resources, networks, and emphasize the values of servant leadership. As your colleague, Emmanuel, from Cameroon recently said, I have the greatest admiration for President Obama and Nelson Mandela. Their ideas and actions have taught me that being a leader is all about putting others first, looking out for the people you lead, and ensuring that the action and decisions you make are in their best interest and will make their lives better. It is all about servant leadership. It is this dedication to empowering others in combination with your talents, your drive, and your collective capacity that will shape the future of your countries, your continent, and the wider world around you. Building understanding between the people of the United States and the people of Africa is as important today as ever before. In an increasingly globalized and interconnected world, it is the people-to-people -people connections we make with our peers from other nations that mark our shared success and truly bring us together. This, the 2016 Presidential Summit, will give all of you and the Americans that you meet here an opportunity to talk about how we can be partners going forward together. And that includes President Obama who will be here with us on Wednesday. With the connections that you all will make here and, and during your entire time here in the United States and will continue to make, you will have a broad network of Africans and Americans ready to collaborate with you on business, community, and government projects. So please stay connected with one another and with us. Before I close, I would like to thank my team and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs for their outstanding work over the past three years. So thank you to David, Britta, Elizabeth, Kofi, Kelly, Abby, Margaret, and our summer intern, Vivian, for everything you have done to expand this program in one year from 500 fellows to 1,000 fellows. And thank you to Kristen Lord and the IREX team for all that you all have done in administering this complicated effort. Your commitment to the fellows and the success of this experience is admirable.
But really, the success of all of this rests with all of you, the Mandela Washington Fellows. We're here today to say that we believe in you, and we can't wait to continue to watch each of your stars rise. I would like to end by quoting a well-known African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you very much. Fellows, please remain in your seats as we're going to go directly into our next session. Please welcome our distinguished panel, U.S. Senator Christopher Coons from Delaware, Patience Keontae, Mandela Washington Fellow, Harvard, Howard University, Natasha Kamani, Mandela Washington Fellow, Virginia Commonwealth University, and our moderator, journalist and director of the School of Media and Public Affairs, the George Washington University, Frank Says No. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Ah, oh, that's what do you think? How'd they do? Fabulous. How'd they do? 50 <laughs> 50. Oh, my gosh. That, what do you think? We did great. Have a seat. <laughs> well, seriously, good morning, everybody. Um, it is so um, much of an honor for me to be here and to be a part of this conversation and talk to this incredible panel. As many of you may know, if you saw my bio, I spent most of my years at CNN. Who knows CNN in the room? <laughs> and what mostly we do in journalism, and what CNN does much of the time, is goes around the world and reports stories, and so many of these stories are bad news stories. So many of these stories are about conflict, and loss, and suffering, and poverty. And what I'm so thrilled about is that today, we can talk about success, and leadership, and growth, and promise, and potential. And we're going to do it with some incredible people. So may I introduce them to you? Yes. First, um, and I'm going to do it interactively a little bit, Senator Chris Coons. Uh, Senator um, was elected in 2010 from the great state of Delaware. Anybody studying or been to Delaware? Um, a proud state here on the East Coast. And um, Senator Coons has a remarkable commitment to the continent of Africa. I think you said that there are 49 countries represented here today, yes? And you've been to how many? 21. 21 of them. And anything you'd like to say not in English to the group? Hamjambo, <laughs> Karibuni. We have, I hope, two Swahili speakers as well. Forgive me. And for those of us who've studied or spent some time in East Africa, Kiswahili is the language uh, that, that binds East Africa together. And where and how did you learn Swahili, and when were you exposed to this great continent? Mimi ni mwana funzi iko 1980. I was a student in the university. <laughs> Sorry. I was a student at the University of Nairobi in 1984 for six months. For six months. Uh, Have you been then, back? And then I returned in 87. Um, and spent a little more time in Kenya, uh, but three months in South Africa, uh, working for the South African Council of Churches for um, Bayer's Nodia and uh, for uh, later Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, and those experiences uh, transformed my life, touched my heart, uh, moved me deeply. I met the most hospitable, uh, most caring, uh, most good people I've ever met on earth in my time uh, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in South Africa. Um, and uh, in, my, in my first term in the Senate, I had the honor of chairing the Africa Subcommittee on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, and have led many uh, congressional delegations. Uh, this year, I've been to five countries, uh, to Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia. Uh, and I recently uh, had the joy of returning to South Africa uh, with uh, our own Congressman John Lewis, who led the March on Selma, uh, and with the daughter of Bobby Kennedy um, for the 50th anniversary of his speech in, in Cape Town. Um, and I, I just, I just want to thank Evan and everybody at the Department of State who've been so terrific in supporting Yali, 
Uh, I am so excited to be with you with a thousand Yali Fellows. Uh, I have met with Yali Fellows at most of the embassies to which I have made visits. Uh, and over the last few years, I have seen you grow in your strength and ability and interconnectedness. And I am so excited about this partnership uh, between the United States uh, and the young people of the continent of Africa. You have enormous potential, unlimited potential. And if I had one opening piece of advice, it was stay in touch. Because as I have met Yali Fellows back on the continent this year, from two and three years ago, they say, oh, I am still emailing or contacting or Snapchatting or WhatsApping or whatever it is <laughs> with my friend from Ethiopia, my friend from Namibia, my friend from Gabon. And we're trading ideas about how to grow our nonprofit, how to be more involved in civil society, how to make change or make a difference. That is enormously exciting to me, and that is an investment uh, I intend to continue to fight for in my role here in the United States. So maybe he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Patience Kente, where are you from? I'm from Uganda. And, <laughs> and what do you want to do? Well, nice question. Um, <laughs> Being here is an incredible, incredible experience. And uh, meeting these 1,000 incredible fellows, to me, was a dream come true. Actually, um, I had to postpone my wedding to attend this and meet these guys. You? Yes, yes. And meet I hope your fiance understands. <laughs> is he here? Still on, yeah. It is still on. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> Thankfully, you want um, to invite everybody? Everyone is invited. I see. You, know, you know how we do it in Africa, yeah? Everyone is invited and everyone is taken care of. Uh, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and another thing, part of the reason I really wanted to come uh, to this fellowship was so, uh, so to meet these incredible fellows because Africa depends on us. Africa depends on each and every one of our efforts. And to see the, uh, the Africa that we want, it's going to be shaped by everyone in this room. So I couldn't, I couldn't waste this opportunity for anything. Patience, you've, you've spent about seven years now, right, working in sort of the public management sector yeah. with an eye on both the national and the global scene. What are you focusing on? What have you been working on? Um, my major focus has been how can young people contribute to the development of Africa? Being, being one of the youngest continents on the, on the, on the globe, uh, how can we as young people contribute to this? And uh, it's through educating our youth. Mm -hmm. I've been a champion of education because without an education, there's no opportunity. Without opportunity, there's no development. And uh, I, I was reading some statistic. Um, over 60 million of, uh, of young people in, in the ages of 15 to 24 are not, are not, do not complete primary school. How will they access opportunity? How will they ac access employment? How will they make a living? And so my focus has been on how can we as young people, how can we impact more young people to come and be the solution that we want to see in our continent? And you're pursuing a master's degree? Yes, I'm, a, I'm pursuing a master's degree in international development, and I hope to focus on Africa, actually. Excellent, excellent, well, welcome. Natasha. I knew this was going to be fun. I didn't know it was going to be this much fun. <laughs> Natasha. Natasha Kimani, you're a 2016 Mandela Washington Fellow from Kenya. Um, you have a, you, several years' experience working to implement the country's constitution. Tell us about that. Well, I need to begin by saying I didn't postpone any wedding to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um. Secondly, um, I have been part of the process. Kenya recently, in 2010, enacted its constitution, 
and globally it's been hailed as one of the most transformative constitutions in the world. So I was part of a team until 2015 that was monitoring the implementation of the constitution, ensuring that structures were in place, legislation was in place, and systems were also in place. You two have worked a lot to focus on women, and I'm particularly interested in one aspect of that, and that is women in peace building. Tell us a little about that. Well, um, especially in regards to security, what the trend that we have seen in Africa is that peace and security prevails when women are part of the peace building process. <laughs> and that's just not at the lower levels, at the grassroots levels. They have to sit at the table the way I'm sitting at the table today. <laughs> they, ha they have to make decisions. They have to be part of the people that say yes or no. And when they're not part of that process, things usually fail. So what we have seen, especially, and that is why the African Union where Patients Works has ensured that this is a decade of women. And we are very lucky as women in this program because this is an amazing time to be a woman. Women everywhere are taking leadership. So, um, the one thing I would say not just to myself, but to all of you, not to just lean in, but to lean all the way in. So let me, let me just pursue one aspect of this, uh, in particular with what you personally are doing and have done to bring women or into this peace building process or to ratify their role and to make it real. I'll be specific in regards to Kenya. When we were developing the security laws, we realize that we can't develop security laws devoid of the people. So there was need for public participation, especially in Northern Kenya where security risks are much higher and at the coast. So what we did is ensure that women, especially from women groups, were involved because when you bring women groups, we call them chamas in Kenya. So these are small groups where women come together, they bring money together and change their communities. So we ensured that they were part of the process and we were able to understand the issues that they face. Because at the policy level, it's very difficult for you to understand what really needs to be done. So that is one of the ways that we ensured by getting them to have a voice, by making sure that they were part of the entire process. So we had the security amendment laws that were a bit controversial here and there but largely benefited the country. And we ensured that 65% of the people involved in the development of those laws, of that, the Amendment Act, were women. 65%. 65% of the people sitting at the table. Was the that... process was led by a woman. Her name is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Muli. She's a former vice chairperson of the Commission for the Implementation of the Constitution. So it was led by a woman. Successful? Entirely. But um, um, I need to be, she's my former boss, so, you know, I have to say it. <laughs> your former boss, okay. How many fellows do we have in the room? Raise your hands. Go ahead. Okay. Let's talk, about the, let's talk about the program, what this fellowship means to each of you. And, Senator, why don't you start? Because I know you've been involved with it for so long. Um, well, briefly, because I'd rather hear from... Patience and Natasha, just about what the Yali Fellowship means. I knew from when uh, we began it um, that it would be an exciting opportunity uh, for young Africans to come uh, travel across the United States, go to different universities, learn from each other. Uh, but I also knew that you had a great deal to teach us, um, that the communities with which you would interact around the country, the University of Delaware, my home state, is one of the universities. Uh, which hosts many of the people in Delaware who have met with Yali Fellows, have come away having learned a great deal. Um, but I don't think I imagined how quickly Yali Fellows would show impact, engagement, effectiveness uh, on the continent. And I'll, one quick story. Uh, I've been to Liberia uh, three times. Um, and if, if you want an example of women leading peace building, Liberia's uh, current president has done a remarkable job in peace building. Uh, I was most recently in Monrovia uh, during Ebola, and um, it was a very difficult time. Um, I couldn't get any other member of Congress to go with me to visit Liberia and to see 
what the Liberian people were doing in partnership with um, a 3,000 American uh, doctors, nurses, and troops who are very brave, uh, very focused on this issue President Obama had deployed there. That was a very good thing for him to do, in my view, uh, for which he does not get enough credit. Um, of all the meetings I did with UN agencies, with ministries, with uh, international NGOs, I had a meeting with the Yali Fellows from the previous two years, every one of whom had left their school studies, had set aside whatever family or personal project they were working on, and had dove into um, working at a nonprofit, starting a nonprofit, engaging in contact tracing, in safe burial, in clean water, in trying to help deliver the <coughs> solutions at the grassroots to fight Ebola. And I could not have been more impressed and grateful for what they were doing for their country. Um, and it gave me huge hope about what Yali Fellows will do. I just want to point one, one thing out. I was telling the senator, I was in Philadelphia at the Democratic Convention the other day, and I happened to be in an event where he spoke. And what he just said to you, he said there too, that we have much to learn from others. So this is not, this is, this is heartfelt. All right, tell us what the fellowship has meant for each of you, what difference it makes, and why you're here. Thank you. Um, I already told you what it meant to me before I even knew what I was, I was going into. I had to give up a lot to be here. But I don't regret that decision. Because when I look around this room, I see hope for Africa. I see a bright future for Africa. I see doctors. I see nurses. I see lawyers. I see magistrates. I see presidents, <laughs> upcoming presidents. Um, and, and, and to me, my biggest take home is, is not the nice places I've seen, the monuments, the White House selfies, and the, <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the presidential handshake. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, th that's, that's my take home. My take home is a network that we are building here, a network of an army of young people that are multi-talented and skilled. So you think you're going to come out of here with this network and stay in touch, as he was saying, and that's gonna, you believe that's going to help you? That is what I'm saying. And already I have seen, uh, yeah, I've seen part of our, our cohort, for example. Some are planning on, on going home and doing some projects that can, in, and can enhance youth participation back at home. And also, um, we have the Yali Lands, where we, where we can actually go online, take courses to improve ourselves. Whether I'm in, uh, for example, I'm in women empowerment, but I can do a course on peace building, I can do a course on youth participation, and then a holistic build-up that trains us to be out there and to be the agents of change. And uh, this program will continue. And 2,000 people, and already we have a network of over 250,000 young people. Imagine what they can do if we do it together. We are stronger together. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I think I've, I think I've heard, heard that expression, uh, <laughs> stronger together. Uh, Nat <laughs> Natasha, how about you? The this, this fellowship, both here um, on the ground, in the, in the contacts and the learning that you're doing, and then how you imagine sort of taking it with you um, as you, you know, resume your professional life. Well, what I've gotten from Yali is that the narrative is changing. We are used the to hearing, yes, the African narrative. We are used to hearing deficits, <laughs> gaps. Um, and here, I've had opportunity, I've had growth. And um, just a few statistics, you know, uh, Africa is one of, has the largest Twitter users. And Africans have used Twitter to change policy, to influence government. You have recently, in South Africa, fees must fall. Yes. In Zimbabwe, about the flag. You know, we, young people, are the voice of Africa right now. And what is happening, our governments are listening to us, whether or not they want to. <laughs> so for me, what I know is that even if we have different struggles, we are also the same. And 
I recently learned that the first stanza or the first lines of the South African national anthem, uh, I mean, I may say it wrong, because Africa is the same as the Tanzanian one, Mungui Bariki Africa. So we may have different issues, but we are one and the same. So how can we use that to move forward? So for me, it's we can be stronger together because we can learn from each other. I was in a class that was so dynamic, dynamic struggles, yet at the end of the day, there were the similar issues, poor institutions, growth here and there. So for me, it's a hope that there's better out there, that we are moving forward. And, and, and you both feel that the kind of networking that you're doing here, yes. and the people that you're meeting, the other fellows, you would not be able to encounter in some other way, in some other place, this is unique? Absolutely, and I need to give a shout out to Virginia Commonwealth University's <laughs> students right there. <laughs> um, the most dynamic. They told me you would be so shy and retiring, <laughs> <and> quiet. <laughs> <laughs> the most dynamic and amazing young people. You have people who are doing great things, such as um, Goban, I am saying her name wrong, from Botswana, who's teaching young people how to cook, you know. And you have people in my class who are leading peace talks. And these are people who are not even 40 yet. So I think Africa is doing amazing things, and we may be the ones taking the world to where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Great. Um, I'll talk about something that, that, is, that I'm passionate about. Um, and my Bison fellows already know about it. Uh, um, how many of you know about the Sustainable Development Goals? The post By show of hands, please. Can I see all of you? Oh, well done. I told you, Africa, Africa knows things. <laughs> um, and how many of you know about Ag African Union Agenda 2063, by show of hands? Oh, impressive. <laughs> um, part of the thing that we need as young people to learn is to love our continent, because no one will love it for us. Um, Agenda 2063 is a, 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 pr a project that, that focuses on the Africa that we want in 50 years. It has a 10, a 10 year implementation plan and we have all these dreams and all, all these dreams that we're dreaming. Africa is dreaming about a united, prosperous, peaceful Africa. But, but how can young people contribute towards realizing this agenda if they don't know about it? First of all, we have to inform ourselves about our own agenda. We have to know what, what the plans for the future are so that we can actively participate in building the Africa that we want to see. So today I challenge all my fellow fellows to go back and read the African Union Agenda 2063, which is a roadmap of, of how we want to see Africa 50 years from now. Uh, many people think it's too ambitious and it's too dreamy, but we are allowed to dream as well, right? We, we never, no one ever started by not having a vision. We have a vision for Africa, but it is on us as young people to find ways of contributing meaningfully to realizing this agenda. Um, it's about health, it's about peace, it's about everything but we can do it together. So I challenge you fellows today to, to, to love your continent. I know you already love your continent. I, uh, that's why you're here, because you want to push the African continent forward. But part of the ways we can start is by knowing what we want for Africa now. And we are not generation next, we are generation now. <laughs> Thank you. So Patience, if, if you, and I'm sure this has happened, you've run into an American, um, either at the university or in your exchanges, <clears throat> and they aren't knowledgeable about what's happening in Africa. And you have an opportunity to share, in a minute, your vision for Africa and to correct their impression. What do you say? Oh, first of all, Africa is made up of 54 countries, actually 55, not one country. 
as you see, we already have 49 of them here. <laughs> That's, uh, but Africa, the Africa I want is a peaceful Africa. The Africa I want is an educated Africa where young people have opportunity, where young people are engaged in meaningful employment, where young people have a say, where young people don't have to, once you finish university, they're not asking you for 10 years of experience. Where do you get it from? When you apply, they say, you're out of, 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 of college, or university and they're telling you 10 years of experience before you get the job. Teach us how to do these things, then we shall do them. Natasha, what, what do Thank you tell you. people? What is, what's your vision? The vision for Africa is an Africa that sits on the table. Um, we're used to the dynamic where traditionally it's um, even when we are partnering with other, other countries, we don't have bargaining power. We take what we can get. Uh, but we need to know that we have more to give than they do. So it's, it's understanding. And a clear example is that even here in America, Africans are the most educated immigrants. Yes. So when we think of what we are bringing to the table, we need to look at it and say that, look, we have the most resources, we have the youngest people globally, and we, we have changed things, and this is a shout out to Kenya. We have revolutionized mobile banking. Everyone knows mobile banking because of Kenya, Safaricom. And we have revolutionized the music industry. Nigerians are here. Nigerian music has taken over. Um, recently, we were somewhere and a Nigerian song came on and the club was full of white people and they knew every single word of that <laughs> song. So guys, this is our country, this is our time. So let's own it, that's all. I think, I think that, that club of white people should go visit <laughs> Nigeria. <laughs> Senator. The 21st century will be the African century. Yeah. You're, you're stating that pretty definitively. The 21st century will be the African century. I am confident of it. When you hear patients and Natasha, they, they lay out the challenge and the opportunity. The challenge is to get right education and skills, agriculture, infrastructure, health care, the whole underlying needs of the people of Africa can and will be met. Governance and transparency are at the core of addressing all of these challenges. But if with your spirit and leadership, Africa tasks itself with taking care of these challenges, it is the continent with the greatest human potential. It is the continent with the greatest natural resources. It is the continent with the most vibrant and engaging culture. 30 years ago, when I was a student in Nairobi, I never imagined M-Pesa. I never imagined Ushaidi. I never imagined that there would be solutions to the technical challenges of the world where cutting edge answers would be coming from Africa. So 2063, some may say is dreamy, but the challenges of 30 years ago have been largely met. The progress in terms of health and education and democracy is substantial. Satisfying, sufficient, no, but substantial. Mm -hmm. And the work to be done can be done by you. I am hugely optimistic. I host an annual conference <clears throat> in my state. To your point about what do you say to Americans who have no idea what is going on in Africa, I host an annual conference in Delaware and its title says it all. Its title is Opportunity Africa. Mm -hmm. So let me, let's turn, you are here to network and to connect and to take great ideas back and to leverage all your activities, but also to learn and to see this country. And you are here at an amazing time in our politics. This is a campaign we have not seen. I, I covered my first 
presidential campaign in 1984. I was three years old, but <laughs> I was the kindergarten correspondent for C no. Uh, but, and that was, the, that was the famous Morning in America campaign. I've never seen anything like this. I'm a student in, uh, of American history. We've seen very turbulent times. This isn't the first time this has happened. And we'll get through it, I hope. But one of the things that has come up repeatedly in this election cycle is, what is America's role in the world? Where should America invest? And relating to this very conversation we're having now is, how, how do you see American investment in African youth? How do you explain that and the value of that to people you meet, to constituencies you confront? And I'll just throw that up as a jump ball. Why are we doing this? <laughs> Go ahead, Natasha, start us off. I was really hoping you'd be patient. But, um, two things, Africa needs connectors. Uh, we lack infrastructure, and in as much as if companies, American companies came to Africa, they would benefit us, it would benefit you too. We'd give you good business. So when you look at it at the global scale, Africa, America does need to come to Africa. For, for another reason is consumerism. The African people right now have the biggest purchase power. I can assure you a number of people in this room own Apple phones, have a MacBook. We are spending more than we earn. That could be a good and bad thing. Yeah. We are, we're, we are, we're good at that in this country, too. <laughs> we are, so the things that we do, the exposures that we have currently are higher, so which means we spend more. We are much more exposed. So when America comes to Africa, they get more from us sometimes than we do from them. And another reason is also because of globalization. Things are changing. Governance is changing. Political scientists don't know what to make of it. We had a professor who told us he could not believe that Brexit happened. So what happens is that you could learn from us as we learn from you because things are changing. So for me, it is imperative that you come to Africa. Africa is uh, full of resources. Africa is a rich continent. And uh, investing in, in young people in Africa not only impacts on the not only impacts on their livelihoods of young people, but on the economy of their countries. And um, where America is, um, I, I know uh, it is in the interest that Africa actually does well. Um, also, investing in young people in Africa, who are the majority of the population, um, increases, like my sister was saying, um, the young population is now the working population in Africa. That means it directly uh, um, improves the economic growth of the country. And then uh, the world uh, global economic, uh, sorry, also increases on the globe. It also increases economic growth on the globe. Sure, That's what sure, I was trying to sure. say. Thank you so much. Senator, I know this is a conversation you engage with your constituents. Um, there is, fortunately, in the Senate, a, a good, solid, bipartisan group of both Republicans and Democrats who have worked together on U.S.-Africa relations. Uh, my good friend, Senator Johnny Isaacson, Republican of Georgia, worked tirelessly with me to extend the African Growth and Opportunity Act for a decade to give uh, duty-free, duty quota-free access to the U.S. market, uh, to all of Sub-Saharan Africa for another decade. Now we need to get busy together um, with trade facilitation, capacity building to make certain uh, that more than just textiles are being exported to the United States. South Africa takes very good advantage of AGOA to export luxury automobiles. Um, more countries on the continent need to be developing uh, industry and manufacturing to export to our consumer market. We've worked very well, again, in a bipartisan way um, with Senator Corker of Tennessee and many others on the Electrify Africa Act, an initiative of the Obama administration that we have recently uh, authorized in the Congress, the Global Food Security Act, the Foreign Aid Transparency and Accountability Act. I could list many more, 
But just as an opening point, because Frank, you mentioned this very tumultuous uh, political season in the United States, this is not a partisan or a political program. Our hope is that you, in your time here, have seen that we have a wide open democracy, that we have robust debate, and boy, are you getting robust debate at our two conventions. Um, but US-Africa relations cannot be something that is only championed by one political party or by one president. I am determined to support and invest in and sustain this program as long as I am a senator because I am confident. <laughs> and I, I don't expect you to agree with either my positions or the administration's positions or America's positions. In my visit with uh, Yali Fellows at the University of Delaware, a number of you challenged me very vigorously in my recent visit to South Africa where we had a terrific meeting with the recent Yali Fellows from South Africa. There were some quite critical statements made you know, to me and to others in our delegation. We don't expect you to come from your time here having fully absorbed and accepted every American position. That's not the point. The point is mutual respect, mutual learning, mutual engagement, because if the 21st century is an African century, so when I go and talk to business leaders, university leaders, policy leaders in the United States, or my own constituents, and say to them, here's why we should invest, it's because the challenges of this century for the planet, climate change, gender violence, technological innovation, the balance between privacy and security. How do we have robust democracies in a time of terrorism? How do we have vigorous and open civil society in a time of concern about security? The answers to these questions will come from Africa and its innovative, compelling young people. So I think this program is pennies on the dollar for us. It is a very modest investment in a strong and robust and good relationship with a continent where there is unlimited potential. And, <clears throat> and I would just like to say two things and then we're going to go to your questions and engage dialogue. One, when I meet with the first year students when they come to George Washington University, I tell them every single one of you should be thinking about study abroad and the places you should be thinking about are not London and Paris, but they're Africa and China and parts of the world that will be this next century. And so I hope they're all coming, coming to visit you and study with you and learn from you. And secondly, this point that you make, this case that you made, is made by you. You are the stories, you are the leaders, you are the inspiration. This is what, you are the best information that the American public could receive, just meeting and speaking with you because you're so unbelievably inspiring in what you're doing. Could we open to questions now? If you've got a question for the panel or any of the panelists, or something you'd like to share. Um, I think we've got people with some microphones, and I see a hand right in the front row here. So please, if you stand, a mic will come to you. Go ahead, yes, ma'am. Yes, in the blue, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Interpreter, okay. Tell us, tell us, please tell us your name, where you're from, and your question. Yes, good morning. I'm Ashura Michael. I'm from Kenyan and I'm deaf. And you are wonderful. It is wonderful to be listening to you this morning. And I wanted to ask you if you could possibly talk about the health issues um, with this uh, fellowship program and what we've been discussing about women and, and talking about people, for example, who have disabilities and people who don't have equal opportunities, who might be oppressed. So we wanna make sure that people have a quality of health, of life, of equal access. So I wondered if you could talk about the disabled people um, in and women issues. Uh, deaf, for example, blind people, people who have mobility issues. Could you address that and what we're going to be doing about that? Natasha, would you like to start? Yes, um, I'd like to start by saying good morning. I learned this from a classmate of mine from Ethiopia, Kalkidan. She's somewhere here, I can't see her. So 
Um, she's from Kenya and I'm so happy that she's from Kenya because Kenya is working towards ensuring persons with disabilities are integrated, not only in the workforce, but ensuring that places are adjusting to ensure that they are safe, that they get good health care. And our constitution is clear that women have priority. People with disability must get opportunities. In and the constitution? It's in the constitution, our Kenyan constitution. The thing is not just to have it in the constitution, it is to ensure that we implement these things. Because these are beautiful things, but if you don't put them into action, nothing is going to happen. Recently, the Persons with Disability Act has been in uh, uh, Parliament. I'm not sure if it's been passed, but that's going to change how people uh, interact with these people, how we interact with persons with disabilities, because they've not gotten opportunities. And from what I understood from Kalkidan, from Ethiopia, there are institutions that ensure that persons with disabilities are able to sit at the national level. So for us, especially here as fellows, it's to ensure that we give these people a chance because Truth be told, what happens, we get information here and we forget. It's just not enough to post on Instagram and Facebook and say, hashtag Mandela Washington Fellow. It's to ensure that if you have a voice, you use it. And to push for it, just like we've pushed for other things. Um, and the challenge, especially with Kenya, is that we have great laws. Implementation sometimes is a challenge, but we are making progress. And progress happens also when there's public participation. And you're part of the public, an important part of the public. So for me, it's what role are we going to play as Yali Fellows to ensure that persons with disabilities have a place and have a voice? Um, thank you. Uh, part of the things that uh, Uganda is doing uh, is ensuring participation of people with disabilities at national, district, and local levels um, by giving them a quota for, for example, to run for parliamentary seats. Um, in any area of service, there's a quota for people with disabilities to be, uh, to be in, in the system. But also, like my sister was saying, that there's an issue of implementation of these laws, because we have them and they're clear, but uh, at least there's a step in, the good, in a good direction. Some, some have helped. Uh, some people to come on board, but we still need to do more. And also, when you come to think of it, as young people, what can we actually do about it? Um, I bet most of the young people here have own businesses or work for some kind of business. Part of the things we can do is encourage our offices, or start with our offices, to make facilities for people with disabilities, for starters, so that they can access they can access bathrooms, they can access the offices. Um, we can be the agents for change from, starting from where we work from, and then hopefully we can scale that up if we are many more. Thank you very much. And to, and, and to hire people with disabilities. Exactly. Yes, and to hire them as well. Thank Senator, you. anything you want to say about this? One of the great challenges, uh, my governor, uh, the head of my home state, uh, has issued to all of us uh, in public life in Delaware is to hire more people with disabilities, to engage more with people with disabilities so that the powerful laws we have here, which provide access that make sure that buses and uh, entrances to buildings and bathrooms are all accessible, um, are not just um, empty monuments, uh, but that the, the life opportunities and experiences of people with disabilities here in the United States improves. Uh, and I will confess, I have just in the last year uh, hired someone to my staff uh, who is a person with mental disabilities. We've also had people work with me in the past with physical disabilities. The United States, in my lifetime, has made dramatic progress, not just in access, but in our attitude. Mm -hmm. And our challenge globally is our attitude, is to recognize that people with disabilities have some of the greatest abilities of all of the human family. And if we hope to be not just tolerant of our differences, not just inclusive of our differences, but celebratory of our differences, challenging age-old uh, misconceptions or prejudices against people with disabilities is one of the most important things we can do to really tap into and to really um, unleash all the creativity and all the capabilities of our brothers and sisters who are living with disabilities. So thank you for your question and thank you for being with us. And if I may, if I may, I just want to say one thing. You're right. We have all sorts of laws. We've made huge progress in this country. But I have a sister with disabilities. 
And some years ago, I was standing in front of an audience of 2,500 people, half of them with disabilities, and she was there with me. And she said, I want to say something. She has cognitive disabilities. My sister has Down syndrome. And she stood up, she's a short, tiny little woman, and she took the mic from me, and she looked at 2,500 people, and she said, the R word. I don't want to hear the R word. The only R word I want to hear is respect. We were all blown away. And that attitude and that advocacy is something that we still need in this country and around the world. And one project that is launching this year is a partnership between UNICEF and Special Olympics. In the United States, Special Olympics uh, has made an enormous contribution to um, the lives of those with disabilities and their engagement with our broader community. Uh, it was an initiative started by the Kennedy family now 60 years ago, uh, but UNICEF is bringing it to many countries around the world, many particularly in Africa this year. Thank you for your question. Shall we go to this side of the room? I see a hand in the back. Sure, stand up. Go, go ahead, sir. I, we'll try to get a mic to you. Ma'am, we'll I'll come to you next, okay? Let's go to this gentleman here. Can you get the mic to, to, the, to you, the back? Can you come? Okay, thank you. And first of all, I would I would like to say that um, um, my name is Gisela Ondel Kanga from Congo Brazzaville, and for the past six weeks, I was learning from the, one of the best universities of this country, which is the University of Reno. <laughs> we are leaders. <laughs> my question goes to the senator. This program calls exchange programs. I've been listening to you. You've been traveling all, uh, around 21 countries of Africa. So my question is this. When are you from the state planning to send young Americans to Africa to exchange with us the same as we came here? <laughs> He was just talking about that. <laughs> Funny you should mention that. <laughs> if I heard your question correctly, it is when are we doing the same program to ensure that young Americans are having the same experience and learning exactly. in Africa? Exactly. And um, around the, uh, the, there was a US Africa summit uh, convened by President Obama here in Washington now two years ago. And um, I spoke with a number of friends uh, from the continent uh, at that conference about trying to begin such a program. Uh, and I will give a great deal of credit to Strive Masiwa, uh, the founder of Econet. Um, and he has recruited a number of other uh, very compelling and successful African business leaders. And they have just launched this summer, just recently launched, um, an, an American uh, business fellows program uh, to bring a graduate, recent graduates of some of the most prominent American business schools uh, to spend six months as interns in African capitals working for African businesses. Um, Strive felt uh, strongly that he didn't want this to be a U.S. government-funded program. He didn't want this to be a U.S.-led program. He wanted this to be an African-funded, African-led program. And I am very excited about it. Uh, I was excited to have the chance to greet the initial class uh, of 50 young Americans who are going over um, and are now in Africa. Um, six months for me as a junior in college in 1984 uh, changed my life and changed my perspective. And I think this can be a, a wonderful foundation um, because there is a legitimate question. You know, why should we only have Africans come to the United States? Why not Americans at similar stages in their career and of similar ages and skills going to Africa? I enthusiastically embrace this uh, as a challenge for us to grow a similar program, not 25 or 50 or 100, but 1,000 um, young, capable Americans, such as you are young, capable Africans, to really engage with the whole continent and to see its whole potential. Thank you for your question. And we'll go to this, this woman here. And then I'd like to come back to this section over here if there's a question, because I want to draw on this part of the room and then this section over here to draw on that part of the room, but the lady with the beautiful dress, or 
what I'm, I'm so saying orange. Go ahead. <laughs> the mic finally got to me because <laughs> this has really been burning in my heart. I wanted to just um, add to what um, um, I, I love you, um, uh, Tasha, and I think you're going to be president one day. <laughs> um, I would want to make a comment because just to, and that question was right on time. I feel Africa as a continent has been hugely misrepresented here in the US. And I think um, we are coming to the place, this experience has allowed Africans to tell their own story and not it being told. Because when you go on the internet, you only see Africa being represented with children with kwashoko and things like that. Africa is not that frightening. I, I, there, there are things I've seen here that didn't necessarily wow me. I'm Nigerian, by the way. My name is Vanessa. And I, I, I was in University of Illinois. And I, I saw things that I see back at home. And um, having to meet some people here, they ask you questions like, oh, you speak English. Like, is that? Your? I'm like, are you serious? And one said to me, your English is really good. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> we are being colonized by the British, OK? Most of our school curriculums are British curriculums. And someone tells me, when you use the tissue paper, please put it in the toilet and flush. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so this experience, and everywhere we go, and why it's imperative for Americans to come, is for them to also come and experience Africa for themselves and understand that Africa is not that frightening. We are not all hungry. It's a beautiful country, continent to be in. They should take our time and come. And come. And I would want to, my question goes to, um, um, I'm sorry, the representative from CNN. I would want you to, I want to um, make this um, plea and a question to you. We don't have media giants like CNN. And it would be good if we can be represented as a continent, not only when there is Boko Haram. Let's be, be able to partner with CNN and tell our own story and show the world the beautiful things that we have. You can come and take courses from us, okay? And one thing I've observed coming here is that the challenges that we have are not peculiar to Africans. Americans are not, are not perfect. They also have a lot of lapses in their government. So it's not an African thing, it's a world thing. And we are going to be improving every day. We would want to partner with CNN. Let's have a, a, a say there. That's my request. And I don't know. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I will personally write your recommendation if you apply to work at CNN. <laughs> No, I, I, I'll be serious for just a minute. I no, that was serious. You were serious. I was serious. You were serious. <laughs> that is, that is a gigantic problem. The ignorance of the American public, largely because of the superficiality of the American media, its reluctance to tell stories that are not just about terrorism and poverty and sick children completely misrepresents entire portions of the planet. Mm -hmm. I would like to see a story about an African scientist or author or inventor. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons, and I'll just say this briefly because I want to get to these other parts of the room, that I started the project I started, and I'm going to invite you all to be part of it, called Planet Forward at the university because you have the tools now to be your own storytellers. And if you want to tell your story about how you are moving the planet forward, this is at George Washington University. We work with students all over the world. We brought a woman from Kenya, an American, an amazing woman from Kenya to Washington to our summit to tell her story and the work she was doing with women. Those are the stories we need. That's how people in this country will understand the investment and the value and the future of Africa. Let me, if I, if I could add briefly one thing. Um, I say all the time to my colleagues, there are three countries that have very large, very developed film industries. Most Americans have heard of Hollywood. Some Americans have heard of Bollywood. Very few Americans have heard of Nollywood. 
Nigeria produced more feature films than America last year. And in, in September, Disney is going to release Queen of Katwe, which I hope you will see and like and promote because Disney is an incredibly powerful media creator company. And they took the risk to film and produce a, a movie that is entirely in Africa, by Africans, about Africans, unlike every previous film I've seen that goes to the American audience, it is Lopita Nyong'o as the heroine about a, a girl growing up in Katwe in Kampala who goes on to become a chess champion, not just of Katwe, not just of Kampala, not just of Africa, but on the global stage. It is a positive, optimistic story where there is no American or European savior swooping in to solve the problem. The solution is from within Africa. And Disney is going to watch that film closely to see how widely it is viewed and how successful it is. Because I'll tell you honestly, in the American media and in Hollywood, it's hard to sell a story that is purely positive and optimistic. It's true of most people. We turn to the news about a bus, you know, falling off a cliff before we turn to the news about a school that is successfully educating children. You have lots and lots of Twitter followers and the ability to move people on Snapchat and on WhatsApp. Take a few minutes and watch this film when it comes out in September and give it some of the lift and boost it needs and then help us hear more positive stories of what you are doing and we will work to help promote it so that Americans learn about the amazing things you're doing. Every one, every one of your profiles and biographies is a film in itself. That's right. Every one of them right. is an inspiring story. But we need your voice to keep pushing it forward over the negativity that dominates so much can, of world news. You can tell your own story. You have more power today than has ever been in the hands of any human being in the history of, of our experience. Tell your own stories. I said I was going to go over here. Where's the mic? There's a mic here. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Here you go. Good morning. My name is Mary, and I'm from Ghana. I was attached to Lincoln University. I have a question for the ladies on the panel. You would agree with me that we are no longer in the generation where women are meant for the kitchen or to be just home. As we spur women on, for greater heights, for women empowerment. We would also want to acknowledge that women in Africa are basically responsible for children, for home, for training children in the home. For instance, I had to leave my three weeks old baby home to be here on this program. Others may think it's great, while otherwise may also be said by people. What do you think we can do as women as we are spurred on to greater heights, that the foundation of family life is not compromised, it's not jeopardized. There may be a fine line between women empowerment and the training of children in our society. Because as we are away from home, we may acknowledge that this is a great move, but also we are also responsible for our families. So I would want you to address this issue of women empowerment and family life in, in, in society. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Great question. Well, um, before that, I'd just like to say to the Nigerian girl, Nigerno de Kari last door. Now, if we go back to this issue, um, two things. The challenge for African women is cultural and social, and it's also internal. Um, I was heartbroken when I heard she's left her three-week-old child. I, I don't know if I'd be able to do that. And there's nothing, there's nothing you could say. And, uh, you know, for example, there's never a right answer when it comes to how do you draw a balance. Because you will listen to women who are CEOs and they'll say, sometimes it's difficult. And I think what, what, what we fear as women is saying that it's difficult because then it will mean you're incompetent. That's not the case. We just need to be honest about our struggles because nobody is perfect and we need a lot of help. And the only way women can succeed, especially is if women support women. A lot of times, women, especially back home, um, the first question I got asked when I came back for my masters is not what I'd studied, is when was I getting married? 
And um, so you're reduced to what did being. What you say? That, that's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and to be clear, that I, I support the institution of marriage, but I'm a human being, there's more to me. And we need to understand that we, the messages we feed our women kind of they make or break them. And this is also in regards to our men. How are we raising our African men? Because um, a lot of times... A lot of times you find um, African women have more of a burden than the men. However, our men are amazing. African men are amazing. In fact, but, but, but we need to be honest and say that um, the pressure is, is real. The pressure to be perfect. The pressure to be a CEO, yet when you get home, food must be a gourmet meal. It's real. So I think for me, there's no, there's no beautiful way to talk about leadership and women. We need to be honest, and we need mentors. We need friends who are peers. You need to have coffee with someone, and you need to have people who you surround. I think for me, what has helped me is community. What has helped my friends who are married with three or four children is community. And sometimes, you cannot work alone. You cannot do it alone. So for me, it's find people who will support you, feed yourself positive narrative, and ensure that if it's too much, it's okay to say enough. Patience. Patience, I'd, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear, to hear your response, but I'm also thinking about that confluence, that place that you work with women and youth, and whether that youth component represents a significant part of this conversation. Um, it is a tough question because it is hard to, 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 to strike a balance between uh, family and work and all that goes on mostly on the women's side. But luckily, we have, we have been blessed by God with, a, with being multitask, we multitask a lot. And that being said, we also need help sometimes. We need support, supportive community, we need a supportive family, we need supportive friends, and we can't do it all alone. But at one, at one point, like my sister was saying, when you can't go further, you, you have to choose your priorities. As a young person, you should know what you want from life. Set clear goals, set things that you feel that you can manage. And if you can't juggle all the things together, put some things aside, be realistic when making these goals. As most of us here, I'm sure, are career women, most of our fellows here. Um, but there's, there's a time to, to say, um, I can't or I can do this, or I can manage to do this, or I won't manage to do this. So when, as leaders, we're expected to know when that time is. That's part of the things as leaders we need to develop, how to, how to go about things and how to let go when we can't. Thank you. Add, um, a lot of things that have helped, especially the European market and America as well, for places like Google and Facebook, is ensuring that their environments are conducive. And there's a huge B&E &E track here. So as you create your companies, ensure that there's a breastfeeding section. There's a section for women to play with their children. So it has to be, it has to be practical to ensure that, because Look at Facebook, it thrived even more when Cheryl took over, but she had a family. And so we need to understand the changing dynamics and as entrepreneurs, ensure that before we demand from government, we are doing it ourselves. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, question on this side of the room. Yes, ma'am, toward the front. Have a mic, here we come. Oh. All right, well, well, we'll come to you next. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Charles from Togo. Uh, thank, thank, you, thank you very much. I am from the University of Minnesota, and I say hi to you, all of you. I have a, a question. In the United States, we have a lot of our brothers and sisters from Africa who live here in, uh, through different programs. Humphrey program, Fulbright program, and those are programs that allow you to stay in the United States for two years or four years. 
But we have a lot of them who live here but represent a very important uh, part of our continent and play a very great role. So what is the uh, United States doing to make sure that all our brothers and sisters that we have here, they are really contributing to the development of Africa? If I'm asking the question, it's because we want to believe that this partnership that we are having with the United States is a win-win uh, partnership. So what is the United States doing so that we have our brothers and sisters uh, playing a very important role in the, if, even if they cannot come back, they are still very important and playing their role for the development of Africa. Thank you very much. Senator. Well, um, Charles from Togo, thank you for the question. Um, YALI, although now a thousand members and one of our uh, newer and to me most inspiring programs, uh, is far from the largest. Uh, we have literally thousands of African uh, graduate students and fellows and participants uh, in many different programs. Um, I am, and many other senators are, uh, interested in and engaged in trying to support them, fund them, and make sure that these programs are as effective as they can be. Um, we can't really speak of one country and one group. You say, what is America doing to make sure these fellows and graduate students are contributing to the education and the development of Africa? Um, we do our best. Those who are involved in running the programs and in selecting the participants do their best to try and make sure that we are selecting people who are um, committed not to their self-advancement, but to the improvement of their countries of origin and to the world. Um, but there's no guarantees. Um, you can't make someone you know, sign a binding contract that they will return home and be a good citizen and contribute. Um, but we have an eye towards their potential to contribute. Um, I am not directly involved in their selection. There's others here who know more than I, but I'll tell you that the reason we continue to invest in partnership programs is because we continue to have confidence that um, educating um, and engaging with people from around the world is the best way for us to have a better engaged and educated American populace and to have a more peaceful and prosperous world. Um, when I was in Kenya 30 years ago, the family I lived with had been educated in the Soviet Union. Um, and the joke at the time was that if you wanted someone to become a socialist, uh, you sent them to study in London. If you wanted them to become a capitalist, you, you sent them to Moscow. Um, the interesting thing was that the families that they would sit around and argue with as part of the Kennedy airlift, and the, right, um, they had brought home to Kenya different insights and lessons than the people who had designed the programs of the day. I think we have to be conscious that um, our hope is you will have as broad and healthy and constructive an exposure to the American people and our system as possible, and you will draw your own conclusions and do your own things with it and contribute in your own way to the development of your nations and our continent and our relationship going forward. Um, sadly, we have time for one more question from the floor, and I told this woman in the front here that she would be next, so you are, and I'm sorry you're also last. Thank you. Uh, you heard it? Yes. But my name is Amina Isaumaru. I'm from Niger in West Africa. Um, uh, I want to know how many people are French speakers in this room. You see? <laughs> well. <laughs> We speak French because our, our countries have been colonized by France. But we speak Hausa, we speak Fulani, we speak uh, a lot of languages all over Africa. This is uh, our local languages. Uh, thank you to Viti. Viti? <laughs> well, in fact, uh, what the best thing that we, America is doing for us is sharing their experiences with us. But the best thing we can do is to adapt these experiences to our local context. So I have a question to the senator. Um, you talked about the Global uh, Food Security Act. And I was happy to see that it has passed the Congress. So I want to know what is next. Is it going to be enacted during Obama's period before he left? or? How is it going to be? Because I'm really expecting this uh, law to be enacted. But for two reasons. Because first, 
um, the way African countries are being helped is not maybe, uh, we agree that uh, we need to be helped because we need knowledge, sharing experiences. But still, we expect that, for instance, this law will really be a way of uh, partnership, a win-win partnership between America and our countries. We do like uh, to be helped because, for instance, I'm representing here the small-scale producers and farmers. So my, my question is, uh, in facing uh, climate change issues, we know that climate change exists. But what we really expect is the change in development, the way we are being, being helped. We want to do things by ourselves. Okay, so I would really like to know what's the content of this act. Thank you very Thank much, you. Senator. Bienvenue, merci beaucoup pour votre bon accueil. J'ai visité plusieurs des francophonies. Uh, et bienvenue. Il sait parler um, tous les, toutes les langues. Oui, <laughs> non, seulement deux. <laughs> Sometimes three. Um, so first, the best news, I think, is that President Obama has signed the Global Food Security Act into law. It is now law. The bad news was he didn't wait for me to come back from uh, a trip in order to be there when he signed it, so I was waving at him from a long way away as he did it. Um, some of you have heard of the partnership program called Feed the Future. Um, that is what the Global Food Security Act makes law. The Obama administration has had many good initiatives. My concern and the concern of other uh, partners in Congress was that when this president leaves office, initiatives like Electrify Africa or Feed the Future uh, go away if there is uh, a new president of a different party or a different philosophy. So we have worked very hard to get those programs enacted into statute so they will continue. Your question essentially comes down to agriculture, ad adaptation to climate change, <coughs> smallholder farmers is an enormous challenge for the continent. Yes, we are committed to continuing to work in partnership to find and deploy solutions that are relevant to your context in terms of farming, hybrids, uh, appropriate technology, and responses uh, to the significant agricultural needs and opportunities uh, of the continent that has the most arable land not yet cultivated and yet faces very large challenges from climate change. Merci beaucoup. We, we are almost out of time. I'm so sorry we can't take more questions. I'd like to give the panelists each a brief moment to sort of sum up their thoughts before we adjourn here. And I'd like to put the question to each of you in, in this context. All of you in this room are leaders. You have all had a leadership journey. You're also all committed to youth and to this very dynamic and exciting change we've heard about here today. So um, let me ask each of you, and, and, and um, Natasha, let's start with you and just come down the line. How has your own leadership journey um, influenced your work promoting youth, and how does this fellowship experience do you think affect that going forward? I wish you'd ask an easier question. Um, however, my leadership journey to begin with has been greatly influenced by the people who have gone out of their way to impact my life. And that's because they believed in me. And for me, leadership is ensuring that you're able to transfer your knowledge to someone else. So if you're selfish with your knowledge, you're not a leader. So for me, that has been the one thing I'm learning and that has influenced young people, especially when it comes to social media, learning to use that platform for public participation because we have realized that Kenyans don't interact, especially young people, with the original old formats of public participation. When you call them for forums, they don't show up. But when you trigger something on social media, we have something we call Kenyans on Twitter, KOT. Um, they go crazy. Recently, we had a, a musician who was well-loved that I will not mention that was deported because of the power of KOT, because they realized an injustice had happened. And they used that platform to ensure that women's rights were protected. So for us, 
especially currently we're working on a national social media policy to ensure that there's access to information. So for me, my key area right now has been focusing on how to ensure that not only youth have a voice, but young women, because voices are different. A voice from Northern Kenya is very different from a voice from the coast. So it's ensuring everybody gets heard. And for me, I'm a product of people believing in me. So that is my call to all of you. What you have learned here, ensure that you teach it. Because not everyone will get an opportunity to be a Yali Fellow. Don't be selfish with what you've learned. Ensure that you impact, no matter how small. Patience. Uh, thank you. Um, throughout my life, I've been driven by the fact that youth need to participate. Youth need to have a voice. And whenever I saw an opportunity to encourage that, um, for example, uh, when I was still in Uganda, I ran for office on the National Youth Council and to represent young women because their voices were not being heard. And what I did during that time to make sure that women, young women were actually being heard, um, there's these grants that they were giving through the National Women's Councils to help women do some uh, income generating activities. But we noticed that this money was, was going to 50 year olds only and 50, 60 year olds, but yet women is an all encompassing word. Women can be as young as 16, as 18, and they're doing something with their lives. So part of the things that I strived for was to make sure I, I actually lobby the National Women's Council to, to actually put aside a percentage of that money to help young women also in income generating activities so that they can, they can build a, li a life also. Uh, so I've been pushed by the fact that I want equality, not only for youth, but also for young women. And once young people are educated and young women are also educated, there's, the possibilities are impossible. Senator, how about, how about how about your leadership journey? Well, first, um, thank you for the chance to be with you again. Thank you for a chance to hear your questions uh, and to hear your stories. And Natasha and Patience, uh, you are wonderfully inspiring and challenging. Thank you for what you're doing. Can we give them a round of applause, please, for what they're doing for all of us? You have a special opportunity there were thousands and thousands of applicants for this program. And you've had the opportunity to be here, to meet each other, to connect with each other, to learn from the United States, and to teach us. So please, be faithful, be hopeful, be optimistic, believe in yourselves, believe that your stories can teach us and can change your world. This program is named for Nelson Mandela. Some people put Nelson Mandela on a pillar and said he is the greatest human being in history, and he is certainly one of the greatest. But when asked, am I a saint? He said, no, I am not a saint, unless by saint you mean a sinner who just keeps trying. You, you have seen an America that I suspect is different than you expected. I am certain that you have had experiences, positive and negative. I hope that as you go home, after you get to hear from our president, you will reflect on the fact that America is a young democracy and a young country that is not perfect, but that I think deserves some recognition as a democracy that just keeps trying, where we keep trying to make it more just, we keep trying to make it more fair, and we keep trying to ensure that we are fully including the talents and the skills and the abilities of people with disabilities, of youth, of women, of people from all backgrounds. Ours was a country founded with great ideals, but really not very good practices. And over 230 years, we just keep trying. So frankly, thank you for a chance to be with you today and for your inspiration to me. Let's keep trying together. Thank you. He, he didn't answer the question about his leadership journey, but I think he did in what he said.
and in the way he said it. And um, I also want to thank these two amazing women, <laughs> leaders, and uh, all of you for, for what you have done and what you are doing, and maybe even more importantly, no, absolutely more importantly, what you will do, because it's all about the future. So thanks to the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders Presidential Summit for allowing you all to be here and for allowing these incredible people to share um, their insight with you. Thank you. Thank you.